Turn to somebody next to you before you're seated, look them dead in their eyeball and tell them, I like you a whole lot. Tell them that and you may be seated. A whole lot, not a little bit, a whole lot. Good job, worship. Y'all be available afterwards? Y'all be able to, okay. All right. Mm-mm-mm. Midterms are coming. Praise Jesus. All right, all right, all right. Hey, as uh, normal, if I could get your attention, please. I love our 11 o'clock lecture. It's one of the only schools in the nation. And I want to go back to our founder, Dr. Uh, I was going to say Dr. Lindsay, but that uh, Dr. Gordon Lindsay. Um, one of his passions was that we would not just have our normal professors and teachers teaching the things that they were experts at, but also bring in experts in their area of ministry and have them in for a few days at a time. And that goes way back uh, throughout our 50 plus years of history as an institution. And, uh, and today, I wanna read the bio of your guest minister. And I really, uh, I used to, when I was director, I would have uh, Dr. Alicia all the time because of her love and compassion and her ability to literally um, help you uh, and the, and the empathy of working with some of the soul issues that, uh, that we struggle with. So let me just read out to you her bio. Dr. Alicia Britt Cholet uh, is an award-winning writer. Dr. Cholet um, speaks internationally and has authored eight books, which that's a lot of books, let me just tell you, uh, <laughs> in, uh, G, including uh, Jesus Hidden Years, uh, Yours, 40 days of decrease, a different kind of hunger, a different kind of fast. Let's come on now, let's get some of that. A sacred show, uh, a holy departure from fast faith. Let's get a holy departure from fast faith. Come on, Jesus. Uh, but of her greatest honors, uh, she is a parent to three extraordinary, I didn't know this about you till I read this, special needs children. Uh, through the miracle of adoption with her husband of 26 years, Dr. B Baker, uh, Dr. Excuse me, Barry J. Cholet, and uh, completing her doctorate in leadership and spiritual formation two years after being diagnosed with breast cancer and being entrusted with the soul care of world-changing leaders as a founding director and mentor of the Leadership Investment Initiatives. She enjoys, pay attention, ping pong, let's go, golf. <laughs> Golf thunderstorms, come on, listen, Hispanics, jalapenos, wildwoods, silent spaces, and to study men and women learners and leaders across ethnic diverse groups. And, uh, and so, what a blessing to have Dr. Sholey here today. Would you please, Christ for the Nations, give her a warm welcome as she comes to leadership, invest in you. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. You're such a oh, thank you, thank you. Family, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Jesus interrupted my atheistic existence just weeks before I was about to begin my pre-law studies. I sincerely believed for the first chunk of my life that there was no God. God hadn't created man. It seemed pretty obvious to me that man had created God, because there were just so many questions in life that were never going to be answered by science or reason or experience. So it was understandable that individuals and entire cultures would create mythical beings, call him God, call them gods, stuff them in the gaps, and calm your fears. As a young atheist, I just considered myself a fierce realist who preferred unanswered questions over fairy tales. But then Jesus, the God who pursues even those who deny him, interrupted my atheistic existence with an encounter so tangible on every level that I would have had to commit both intellectual and emotional suicide to deny God's reality. But Jesus interrupts our lives in his mercy. He saves us from ourselves, and he saves us from our sins, and he saves us from a very real, very terrifying hell. And he gives us his presence. 
he gives us eternity with him. And that eternity is worth the fight here on earth. And it's that fight here on earth that was in my heart when I was preparing to be with you. Corinth, in Paul's day, was one of the largest and most wicked cities in the Roman Empire. Sin had been normalized. Evil had been monetized. And understandably, that young church was struggling to live free. And it was in that context that Paul wrote the following weighty words, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, familiar words. He said, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul's heart as a minister of the gospel sounds so loudly in this text. It's as though he's writing from an ache. He's writing from an age-old ache. It's as though he's saying, just as it takes training and discipline to run a physical race. It will take training and discipline to run this spiritual race. You never graduate in faith from the school of training and discipline. That school stays in session until we see Jesus face to face. Paul says, I'm still disciplining myself. I am still disciplining myself because I don't want my story to be that after I coached you in finishing well, after I helped you develop the disciplines to finish well, to complete your race, after I helped you, I don't want my story to be that because I didn't develop those disciplines, that I was disciplined qualified. What an image. What an image of one of the dangers of ministry. May God help us. May God help us finish well. Family, all of us stumble in many ways. All of us stumble along the way. But what we do with our stumblings will write our legacies. How would your legacy be written today based on what you're doing with your stumblings? I remember two beautiful souls, a married couple. They were in their 30s. They were rising stars pastoring a beautiful church, doing a great work. And one day, I woke up and saw the news, which used to only come on the TV. And this man, the husband, was in the headlines. He made the headlines. You might say he fell into the headlines, accused of inappropriate conduct. I had spoken at their church several times, and so immediately I picked up the phone, and I called their house, and this dear man answered, and I said, oh, my friend, I'm so sorry. I just turned on the news, and I saw you in the headlines, and I'm so sorry for the false accusation that's been brought against you. What can we do to support you? And he stopped me. He stopped me immediately, and you know what he said? (laughs) He said... 
I will never forget it. He said, oh, Alicia, it's so much worse than even what they reported. Immediately confessional. It is so much worse than even what they reported. He said, I've been struggling with this addiction for years and years and years, and I know it may sound crazy, but I'm so relieved that now everybody knows. He said, now I can finally get free. Now there's a response to record for if we ever find ourselves stumbling. This is a King David Psalm 51 type kind of response, isn't it? This is a have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. An example to us all, alone in the shadows, this beautiful man of God was losing his race but surrounded in the light, he found hope to end well. And to date, that's exactly what he seems to be doing. I watched, we didn't live in the same place, so my husband and I watched this lovely couple as he went through everything he could possibly go through. (laughs) I'm talking all of it. All the confession, all the repentance, every opportunity for rehabilitation, every opportunity for therapy, He signed up with anybody who was willing to help him in accountability. He really wanted to be free. He wanted to finish his race well. And in the light, he found the support and he found the strength to develop the disciplines to do just that. Years and years later, we saw him again at some kind of conference. We bumped into them and we sat down and we caught up about how the years had unfolded. And in the course of that discussion, I asked him a question. I said, do you see yourself at some point returning to the ministry? And again, he said something really profound. And I want you to hear this with hope in your heart. But sobriety. He said, no, I have realized that for me, probably not for others, but he said, for me, that the combination in pastoring The stage, the applause, the authority, the honor. It's not a safe place for me. And so I will serve God with all my heart in other ways. Family, when we all sit around that big table on the other side, we are not going to be passing around our resumes. So wisdom invites us to spend less energy on what looks good and more energy on what is good to help us finish this race well. Wisdom invites us to work at the disciplines we need to develop To, as Paul said, not be disqualified for the prize. And I know that that phrase, I know that it can press on some doctrinal hotspots. I understand that. But I think we can all agree that this is not the longest life we're going to live. This is not the longest life we are going to live. So our daily challenge is to live with eternity in view, especially with regard to our shadows. Because if we don't attend to them, they will thicken, they will not thin. If we do not attend to our shadows, they will thicken, they will not thin. And we may stumble in them in such a way where we find ourselves lost. And that is the ache that gripped me when I began preparing for our three days together. It made so much sense to me when I got the invitation and I was able to say yes. It made so much sense to me to teach you from my newest book. 
overflow of 30 years of study. Maybe I'll mention it a little bit more tomorrow. That's what made sense to me. But I couldn't escape this ache. I could not escape the ache for you to finish well. I could not escape the sense that there are some of us present that if you do not attend to your shadows now, that you may be in danger of not ending well. So I want to talk with you these couple of days about some practical principles to help us, and I say us because I still have clay feet, yes? The enemy never retires from his temptations. Some practical principles to help us not fall into the headlines. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? It's just heartbreaking to see week upon week, month after month, yet another stunning soul. Stunning souls, yet another beautiful, brilliant soul in Christendom collapse from within. And thankfully, for most of us, that is not the end of our stories, is it? While we still have breath, there still is time to end well. While we still have breath, there still is time to end well, as both King David's example and the more recent example of even the young couple that we're pastoring illustrates. While we still have breath, there's still time. But you have chosen to come to a Bible school. And so I'm guessing that you have chosen to come to a Bible school because you want to be trained and equipped to serve Jesus all around the world. You are here to be trained and equipped to serve and become ministers all throughout the world. And we need to enter into that profession with our eyes wide open. We need to enter into that profession with our eyes wide open to the spiritual warfare that comes with this territory, and you know that well. We also need to enter this profession with our eyes wide open to the unique vulnerabilities that come with ministry as a profession in this day in history. Now, in the story that I just told, the minister pointed out some of those vulnerabilities. In short, the stage, the applause. Attention can be intoxicating, especially when we are leading to be loved instead of because we already know that we are loved. Attention can be devastating, especially when we are leading to be loved, instead of leading because we already know we are loved. The vulnerability of attention in ministry, we cannot underestimate it. A friend also pointed out another vulnerability that people face when they choose ministry, when they feel called into ministry as their profession. If I remember the context correctly, there was a group of us and we were all mourning together. Uh, another beautiful, stunning soul who loved Jesus falling into the headlines. And, and though it may be obvious, I want to state this. If we're serving successfully while sinning willfully, being exposed is a mercy. Yes. If we're serving successfully while sinning willfully, being exposed is an absolute mercy. Because, as I've said, we still have time to finish well. So thank God for the prophets who show up. 
and talk to us about our stuff. Thank God for being found out. It's far better than the alternative. This man who had been called by God to be a businessman, he said this in pointing out this other vulnerability that I really want to draw our attention to. He said, you know, Alicia, in my profession, there are multiple gauntlets that you have to get through before you can ever be in a position of leadership. He said, I have tons of coursework. I have all sorts of certifications. There's internships. There's mentoring. There's regular job performance reviews. And then only after years of supervised accountability do I even stand a chance to possibly consider leadership. And then he said this, but that's not how it seems to work in the church, is it? Well, um, no, which makes ministry as a profession rather unusual and quite vulnerable. Now, if you need a brain surgeon, right, you can safely assume that they've had a minimum of 14 to 16 years of training post high school. They've had preparation. They've had certification. If you hired a professional electrician, you can safely assume that they've had over 8,000 hours of working as an apprentice under another licensed master electrician. If you hired somebody, a CPA, to do your taxes, you can safely assume a minimum of four years of study in the area of accounting or possibly even economics and state certification. But when it comes to those whose profession is to care for something eternal, we can assume, well, what? What can we assume anymore? What can we assume, family? If somebody presents themselves on Insta as pastor this or minister that or prophet this or apostle so and so, what? can we safely assume beyond, hopefully, a willing heart and an available spirit, which are beautiful, beautiful treasures. Now, I am not saying that we should all have 14 to 16 years of education before we call ourselves ministers. Please, no. Oh, no, no, no. No, we've had times in history like that. We have had times in history where the only people that could read the Bible, let alone teach and preach from the Bible, had to have decades of academic training. The only people who could even begin to open this word were people who were academically privileged, monks and priests among the academic elite. Now, that's why Wycliffe's commitment to getting the Bible and the language of the common people was such an incredible game changer. We do not need to return there. Absolutely, we do not need to return there. But now, if you think of a pendulum swing, perhaps we find ourselves way, 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 way over on the other side. Way on the other side, where the primary qualification for ministry is desire and availability. And as I said before, those are treasures, absolute treasures. But healthy is somewhere in the middle, isn't it? Somewhere in the middle, and the problem is that pendulums, they only see middle in passing, don't they? They only see middle in passing, historically from one extreme to another. Somewhere in the middle is health, willingness, and as you are pursuing training. Somewhere in the middle, personal call and interpersonal supervision and accountability. Health is somewhere in the middle, and we need to pursue that. So again, I'm going to repeat myself. I am not at all suggesting that we return to the other side of the pendulum. But I think we would be foolish to not recognize that where we are today 
leaves us rather vulnerable. Vulnerable to what? Vulnerable to fast-tracking, gifted individuals to the detriment of their souls. Vulnerable to fast-tracking, gifted, talented individuals to the detriment of their souls. So that brain surgeon, they can still be considered a pioneer in their field, even if they were simultaneously engaging in a 20-year affair. And that master electrician could still be called brilliant, even if he goes home at night and rages on his family. And that CPA could still be considered top of her field, even if she's experiencing addictions to prescription drugs. But that is not the case in ministry, is it? Because integrity is our greatest and most lasting credential. So here we come to me trying to wrap words around the ache in my heart. To finish well, there is no better time than now to deal with your shadows. To finish well, there is no better time than now. Could you say that word with me now? now. To finish well. There is no better time than now to deal with our shadows. And you know exactly what I mean by your shadows, don't you? Yeah. You know right now. I don't even have to wrap words around it. Because I know what I mean by my shadows, right? We all do. And we're talking about those persistent patterns, those shaming memories, the sickly cycles, the tenacious addictions, the unholy habits. And some of you, bravo, you are hitting that thing head on. Okay, just like my minister friend, you are taking every opportunity to repent, to confess, to get help, to get accountability, to take advantage of the incredible humans you have leading you and serving you to receive the support that you need to get free. You're disciplining yourself and you're on the right track, but in my heart I sensed there were others of us that aren't hitting it head on. We brought it with us, but we're not hitting it head on because what we're hoping for, what we're hoping for is that if we just can get in this atmosphere, that that thing will just fall off our backs. We are hoping, we came here with the sincere hope that if we could just linger in worship long enough, if we could just hear the word strong enough, if we could just shout in warfare loud enough, that that thing would just fall off of us, that it would finally just let go, that it would finally just disappear. And this atmosphere is powerful. I've been coming now for 18 years. Haven't been able to come since COVID. I am consistently watered by what has been cultivated here. The purity of worship, the humility, the quality of instruction. I'm continually watered by what I encounter here. But hear me when I tell you that the enemy is thrilled for you to believe that just being in the atmosphere is going to be enough. Oh, he's thrilled. He is thrilled for you to believe that without discipline, that without humbling ourselves, without confession and repentance, without seeking help and accountability, without doing the hard stuff that our shadows will just fall away, but clearly not. Look at the headlines. Learn from the headlines. The enemy of your soul is playing the long game. He is playing the long game. 
and he is happy to even go quiet for a bit. We think he's trying to mess with our tomorrow offering. He's got his sight set on a decade from now. His sight set on 20 years from now, on 30 years from now, because maximum influence means maximum collateral damage. Maximum influence means maximum collateral damage when we fall into the headlines. There is no better time than now to deal with your shadows. But Alicia, if I seek help now, I'm going to have to step down from the worship team. Then so be it. So be it. There is no better time than now to deal with your shadows. But Alicia, I just got asked to speak. Man, there's this open door I've dreamed of, and it's going to lead to a whole stack of open doors behind it. If I deal with my shadow now, that door may close. Then so be it. There is no better time than now to deal with your shadows. But Alicia, I just got engaged. And my fiancé doesn't know. If I seek help now, they might leave me. If you love them, there is no better time than now to deal with your shadows. I've lost count of how many stunning souls I've sat with who thought that that thing would just fall off their back when they said, I do. But we've, I've got the dress, we've got the venue, we've paid the down payment, we've lost the money. Yeah, you may lose a lot of money but there's another currency that's harder to recover, and it's called trust. There's no better time than now to deal with the shadows. But Alicia, I didn't choose these shadows. Somebody else's choice has brought them into my life. It's simply not fair. It's not right that this stuck to me. You're right. It is not fair. It is not right. And it wouldn't have been this way in Eden. But we're not in Eden anymore. And there is no better time than now to deal with your shadows. Why? Because of this. Time adds complexity. Time adds complexity. It takes more and more lies to hide. Time adds complexity. So the longer we wait, the more lives we link with, and the greater the fallout of our failings. The longer we wait, the more lives we link with, and the greater the fallout of our failings. I have been in full-time ministry in the sense of traditional ministry. All of us are called to serve wherever God plants us. But as a traditional minister, I've been doing this now for 37 years. And uh, I still remember, as a new believer, I still remember the first time an esteemed pastor in my world was caught having an affair. I, I remember I shook my head not for days, not for weeks, for months. And I said, but but he cried every time he mentioned the name Jesus. In sincerity, he cried every time he mentioned the name Jesus. I, I remember later on, um, I've served, as, as many of you have, I've served in many different countries. I've been so grateful for that opportunity. And I was in one country, and there was a minister there who was just really in the thick of a, a beautiful revival. I mean, oh, wow. It was amazing the ways in which he was being used. 
people being slain in the spirit, people receiving prophetic words, healing. Uh, he was very, very pursued. And I don't really understand why, but we were asked to speak at the same conference. And so he uh, came to me and he knocked on my door and he said, hey, listen, we're speaking at the same conference. And I just thought it'd be really, really great if the two of us could meet alone each week and really pray to get our hearts in sync for this ministry time together. And I knew that he was highly esteemed, but something inside of me just didn't feel right. And so I said, call me old school, but the only man I pray alone with behind closed doors is my husband. And he was offended. Um, and I wondered if I had been unkind. And a year later, he made the headlines. All over the world, there had been young women who were so enamored with how close he was to Jesus that he had misused them. I've seen too much now. I've seen too much. So forgive me if I am blessed but not impressed with how powerfully you preach. I've seen too much. So forgive me if I am blessed but not impressed by how tangibly I feel the Holy Spirit's presence when you sing. Forgive me if I am blessed but not impressed by how visionary you are and how many good works you have done. I have seen too much to assume anything about your private life from your public persona. Satan is not threatened by your talent. He doesn't give a rip about your talent. He is unintimidated by how gifted you are. But humility, oh, he hates it. Repentance, he resists it. Accountability, he will try to shame you all day long into avoiding it. I've had the joy of ministering as a lecturer here. I think this is my ninth time. I am now 58 years old. And as Adam mentioned, the last 11 years now, have been a breast cancer journey with four recurrences. Now, I treasure your prayers. I'm doing well. If the Lord wills, I am looking forward to several more decades of serving him. But the whole journey has shaped my perspective. When I receive a green light from God to say yes to a speaking invitation, which doesn't happen very often, I find myself asking this question. If I could only give one more message, what would it be? Well, you are my green light. And this is my message. There is no better time than now to deal with your shadows. There is no better time than now to deal with your shadows. So what will you do? I asked the worship team to stay because I wasn't quite sure how we were going to conclude. I'm going to ask them to come now, but in a way that they normally don't. They normally come to lead in worship. I'm actually going to ask the worship team if they would please come to lead and seeking God for mercy. 
if you wouldn't mind just coming and finding a place at these altars. Because family of all the ministries there are, surely leading in worship is among the most vulnerable, isn't it? So I'm going to ask them to lead, but perhaps in a little bit of a different way. And the only direction I had was to read from David's psalm. Now, I have several principles that I have in my heart that I will be sharing the next couple of days. I wasn't quite sure how the Lord would want to conclude, but I think we're supposed to keep it really, really simple. Without music, because frankly, you're going to have to live out your life without having an anointed worship band following you. I'm so, so grateful for what God has done in my heart in worship, but I really felt like silence was what we needed. I'm going to start reading Psalm 51. And if you would like to assume a posture of asking God to search your heart, I'm going to ask you to find a place of prayer. Now, some of you already know that there's some shadows you need to deal with. And I am going to charge you to talk with somebody about that in the next 24 hours before we see each other tomorrow. Find somebody you trust. And, uh, but as I read, I'm just going to ask you to come. And then when the clock strikes 12, you're dismissed officially. And you're welcome to linger if you would rather do so and you're able to. Amen. So worship team, I'm just going to ask. Oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm going to begin to read. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you were proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You take no pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings in delight to you then bulls will be offered on your altar. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite spirit. Oh God, you will not despise. Holy 
Holy Spirit, I ask that you would infuse us with courage, that you would infuse us with supernatural strength. right now hope and faith would rise to deal with our shadows before they deal with us. I ask God that this call would echo. It would echo beyond this room, that it would echo in our hearts all day long, that it would echo in us at night that it would echo in us in the morning. Because it is time and there's something great at stake and we can't afford to keep waiting. I ask that you would banish the lies that keep us from bringing what shames us into the light, that you would banish the lies so that, my God, we can finish well. I ask this in Jesus' name and to Jesus' glory.
isso. us a clean heart. Create in us a clean heart. We choose humility over hiding. We choose repentance over resistance. Is paying the cost now instead of asking others to pay the cost later. We stand as a community declaring that we will deal with our shadows. We will support one another and stand with one another so that we can all finish that race together and hear, well done. <laughs> 